We've traveled a few hundred miles up north, 12 hour journey to trace the trajectory of Paul Norcross, whose journey of excellence has spanned the gaming sector, education philanthropy, and advisory and the politics side with a top US presidential candidate. Join me as I explore the world of Paul Norcross. We're two different people, but there's something we have in common. We are both educated by the Jesuits, and one of the things we were taught was that faith is not a passive thing. It's not just a state of grace, it's an active decision, especially in light of a recent tragedy or something that is fairly hopeless. Tell us how that applied to your life and what it did to you in terms of how you changed it. Well, my son was having terrible health problems when he was a little boy, and uh, one day his, uh, he was having a reaction to his medication and was paralyzed. How young was he then? He was about uh, three, three years old. And my daughter had her 18-month immunizations and had a severe reaction and had a massive seizure and basically died in my wife's arms. And uh, Kim brought her back to life with CPR. And uh, you know, be because of his health problems, our business was doing very poorly and just everything was kind of spiraling out of control. So the next day, I, I collapsed in my kitchen, pulled, pulled myself up on the handles and the cabinets, and I just said, okay, I, I give up, I give in, uh, and uh, just let us get through this, and I'll, I'll dedicate the rest of my life to doing good things. That was the foundation of a decision that you had. Tell us, what, did, what exactly of a transition did you make? Well, with, with, the, with the school, um, when our son was of school age, the private schools didn't want to deal with what he was dealing with, and the public schools didn't have a solution. So actually we were watching a special on Mother Teresa and when she had her epiphany moment of what she had to do with her calling, my wife and I were sitting there and it's like, well, we have to start a school. So we started a school called Phoenix Academy, hence rising from the ashes. And my wife created something called PBIS, which is a positive, positive behavior, behavior intervention. System. Right. And so now that is that system that she developed, we converted to a public school, and so now that's in over 18,000 schools around the United States and 1,100 in North Carolina. Paul, that sounds like praying with moving feet. Is it something that you have advocated into the other parts of your life beyond what's happened to your family and your school? Yes, I mean, it becomes part of the fabric of who you are and what you do and, and trying to do good things and help people in every aspect as far as you can and as much as you can. Paul, I want to talk about two major transition points in your life. Two decisions that you made that didn't have to be made because you were very comfortable where you were. The first one was going from a global logistics solutions provider to the education sector. You had a successful gaming revenue and IT business and yet you moved beyond it. Tell us how you, and you did it and why. Well, actually first and foremost I was traveling quite a bit and I, over a five year period I was on an airplane or in a hotel for a year and a half and being away from my family was not fun and, and uh, also just working in the gaming industry it's, it's something that really derives its revenue from human frailties and I started getting more and more disenchanted with the thoughts of that and migrating more into something that's much more beneficial and focusing more on education. Uh, let's take a step back here. In gaming industry people just see the card sharks and the gaming tables and the baccarat tables and the slot machines. What were you involved with in terms of creating value for that industry? What we did is, for example, the Venetian in Macau and the City of Dreams, we did all the logistics, the project setup, the installation, even set up the laundry logistics. So the, the backbone rooms. of that industry is basically what your firm helped build. Yeah, we, we set up all the original infrastructure on Kotai. And then, what, for example, with, studio, with um, Melco, we came in later and did a, uh, a total revamp of their supply chain department and lean management, contract management. So tightening up all the operational things as well. You're creating value for a sector that actually is very, very lucrative. And yet, you went beyond that into something that had fewer margins and at the same time fraught with political risk. 
That's the education sector, fortunately or right. unfortunately. Tell us why you went into that and how you manage the politics in that sector. Well, what I like to say is that the people that know what I did are the ones that don't like what we did. So uh, those are the ones that are, are impacted in a, in a negative way. They don't like it, the positive changes. And the people that uh, really benefit from those changes don't really understand what's happened. Well, for our audience, let's talk about what reforms you're introducing specifically. The concept of a charter school is alien for viewers in the region. Mm -hmm. But talk to us about the advantages of that vis-a-vis -vis the traditional public school model. It's a privately managed, publicly funded school. So we still have to follow all the same rules and regulations as a traditional public school. But we're able to operate it in a leaner, more efficient fashion. So we receive about 70% of the funding. However, we usually always have cash surpluses and have better results in the district schools. So you're saying public sector mandate, private sector efficiency, and value creation. Yes. And you don't make a lot of friends doing that, do you? Not so much, no, no. Give <laughs> not, me a specific reform you've done that's created value where there was none. We eliminated the cap on charter schools. There was, a, there was an arbitrary cap in our state. We got it eliminated. And now that we've grown over 60% since that in the last four years. Uh, also completely reformed the governance structure with the Charter School Advisory Board and also doing new regulations, regulatory reform. And now this most recent session, there's a restructuring of where the department is within the state and away from the Department of Public Instruction to the State Board of Education. One of the innovations you've made, and you and Kim have made together, is looking at a school as not just a laboratory for college graduates. You actually have different tracks for people who want different professions. Tell us more about that, the IB program and your apprenticeship program. Well, there, in our area, we've been decimated because of furniture, textiles, and tobacco basically leaving our area. They've all gone to Korea and China, and then basically tobacco just being splintered out. So in our community, the only, avi the only industry really growing right now is, air is aviation. So Honda Jet is building their jets there. You've got Heiko Aviation, which has about a half a billion dollar investment there now. And so we need a pipeline of jobs for them to maintain their investment to get a in match between supply and demand correct? right so we've got a huge we've got an emerging industry with no so no pipeline of qualified labor so the the concept of the high school model is an ib or you know university track program on one side in the middle of the general track where it's still an ib school you're getting a quality education but it's it's more middle of the road and then on the other side we've got a career track to make it attractive for children to go into a career in aerospace, aviation, and then also into logistics. And we have corporate partners with Honda and Heiko. So when they graduate, they'll have an associate's degree from our community college, and they'll also be guaranteed a job at one of our industry partners. Now that seems to be a good relevant track for the Philippines to follow. Is that actually why you're here? Yes, it is, because I, I see a lot of things going on here that are parallel, the, the good things that are going on that are parallel to the, to the U.S. where you've got an emerging strong middle class with an education, educated populace, but now it's what track do you want to go into more on the Singaporean or European model where you're going into a career working with corporate partners and you'll be employed when you get out of school. I understand you went to two different schools in the Philippines and that molded you as a person. I, when I first got here, I started at IS, and I went to Lourdes in Mandaluyong. Were you, safe to say, were you a minority in that school? I was the putting on I was the, the, the You were white, the white monkey yes. and the only white person. Yes, I was the only one. And it, it was, th those two years were a struggle and, you know, in a very difficult situation, but I think those are probably the most two valuable years I've ever had in my life. Tell us how you see the Philippines growing based on your decision to come here and invest and look at these opportunities. I know the opportunity, the options here have, are somewhat limited right now. And with such a, an emerging, growing, strong middle class, I don't know that there's an opportunity, I don't know that there's many supply, there's much supply of education in that area. Let's look at the education sector in general. You've made these reforms, but there's been a lot of opposition to that. Now you're also working with a presidential candidate who happens to be a darling of the current crowd of voters, but 
has taken a lot of controversial decisions and made a lot of controversial statements as well. How do you manage politics and education together in both fields? There's no separation, sadly, between politics and education, especially in the United States, because it's the largest single line, line item generally in every state budget and every county budget. So when you've got that much money involved, there are a lot of interested parties and a lot of hands in pockets and a lot of interested people trying to protect their, their domain. So when you're going in to try and make changes and try to make things more efficient and streamline, you're bucking the standard, you're bucking the rule, and the, the, the quote-unquote establishment does not like that. So. For example, what the uh, Carson Scholars Fund. That's something that is innovative. That's Dr. Carson's scholarship program. And near and dear to your heart, the library program, he's got Carson reading rooms that are in underprivileged schools and a special place for children to have books and access to books and to read to cha and change in their lives. Now, those, de those decisions to actually get from the gaming sector to the education sector, the education straddling the political side, that seemed to build toward the vision of what you have for your home country but also the country that you're returning to in a way to expand your business. Tell us how you see the Philippines growing based on your decision to come here and invest and look at these opportunities. Well, education, as you know, I went to school here. Education has always been very important. And the, the, the importance to the family and the importance to the student of getting a solid education. And I, don't, I know the, opportunity, the options here have, are somewhat limited right now. And with such a, an emerging, growing, strong middle class, I don't know that there's an opportunity, I don't know that there's many supply, there's much supply of education in that area. Kind of the emerging middle class to have a solid school with an international foundation and international partners that isn't in a price range that, that very few people can reach. Well, one of the projects we're setting up today is looking at a library that's actually built out of a BPO, a stadium, and an educational center. So I'm looking forward to seeing you in action in a bit. Thank you. Thanks. So why don't we just talk about your shift to education. Earlier we spoke about faith being a response to a tragedy. Your family, you yourself are no stranger to that. Tell us what led you to get into education and the foundation of Seven Degrees. The education was the creation of the school and, and the situation you just referred to. The foundation itself, uh, I was actually back in the Philippines at a reunion for IS and I was talking to v Vicky Herrera and we were talking about the books that she wanted in Tagaytay. And so we had shipped about 6,000 books, and she said, this is such a wonderful thing. You know, it really, it's a great, we, we love it. The books are fantastic with her kids. And so my sister had just passed away from cancer. And on her deathbed, she had said, I, I never did anything. I never accomplished anything in my life. And I said, well, I will change that. I give you my word. I will build a legacy for you. So when I was back at the reunion, I told Vicky, I said, I'll set up a foundation and we'll just start shipping books to the Philippines and set up libraries. And, and the first libraries that we set up were uh, in my sister's name. So that's how it all started. And then now the culmination of the foundation working with the school and basically the name Phoenix of the rebirth and, and being reborn, it, it all just kind of culminating into one now. Education is important to you, not just on a philosophical level, but on a very personal level. And it took years for that to grow into you. Tell us for your first experience with school. Um, I understand you went to two different schools in the Philippines, and that molded you as a person. Tell us about that before you got to Seven Degrees. Well, I, I, when I first got here, I started at IS, and that was back in the mid-70s, and things were a little fast-paced, and my mother wanted me to go back to a Catholic school. So I actually was supposed to go to LaSalle, and um, the first day my name was taken off the roster because they had a new rector. So after school had already started, uh, my mother needed to find a school for me, so Catholic school close by, I went to Lourdes in Mandaluyong. Were you, safe to say, were you a minority in that school? I was the putting on I was the, the, the You were white, the white monkey yes. and the only white person. Yes, I was the only one. And it was that those two years were a struggle and you know, in a very difficult situation. But I think those are probably the most two valuable years I've ever had in my life because they taught me to keep taking punches and, and not literally and figuratively and get back up and not, not uh, fall down. 
Tell us more about that. It usually is the case of a person bullied because this person's a minority uh, in an immigrant situation. In your case, it was a reverse of that. Tell us how did it feel, what led you to get better and get along, first and foremost? Well, it goes back to the faith question again, or point, and that's a gift that my mother thankfully gave me, which leads into the next one of family. And I had a strong family to back me up. And then basically forgiveness, just kind of like that song now, let it go. The, the you hear every song. five seconds, <laughs> exactly. let it go. So that, that's a very poignant song, actually. Maybe that's why it resonates with so many people, because to move forward, you just you have to let it go. Okay, well, we've got lots of work to do. Oh, thank you. And some muscles to build. <laughs> I need some of those. <laughs> there you go. sun sets on the day. Tell me, what is the most decision, important decision you've made in your life? Marrying my wife. Everybody says that. Why? Because I have no brakes. She's my seatbelt. sun sets on another day. Tell me, what is the most decision, important decision you've made in your life? Marrying my wife. Everybody says that. Why? Because I have no brakes, and uh, Kim is always the one holding me back. And this is the perfect setting for that because I'd be the one driving with no seatbelt. She's my seatbelt. Give an example of how she's been able to put some balance and restraint in your life. That's a very, very <laughs> deep question. I don't know. Um, just every single day, I'm always out there, as she says, about five miles ahead. And she said, uh, you know, trying to stay in the box. I don't know where the box is. So she's always trying to keep me in the box a bit to keep me out of trouble. Never be allowed at home. I walk along. Is it a partnership of equals? Yes, very much so. Actually, She's a little higher than I am. I, I, I try to stay up. And you're not trying to be nice? No, that's a fact. So and everybody that's close to me will attest to that. And you fi I finally found something to dovetail your interest with, and that's education. You're, yes. You seem to like be like different personalities, yes. and education happens to be the thing that draws you together. Yes. How do you complement each other with that? Uh, again, she's the one that kind of keeps things in balance, and I'm the one kind of going forward and going in different directions, and we're kind of keeping focused. That seems to be the balanced partnership we're all looking for. Yes, yes, indeed. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate your time. Thank you, sir. We're I off to the it. next ride here. Let's and go fast. Let's enjoy it. All right. Oh, Cheers. Great. Cheers. Watch out. <laughs> Another great adventure here in Thought Leaders. I'm Quinton Pastrana. Join me again next week as we map the minds and the moves of the countries and regions' most successful people. See you next week.